Yeah, I kind of gave up on using Zoom for sessions. So to speak. Um, especially because I like I was kind of fangirling with you just a minute ago. I don't meet a lot of and don't actually get to work with a lot of people who specialize in chronic pain uh, or and and chronic illness. So I am just so thankful, Daniela. And if you will pronounce your last name for me and for everyone, because I just yeah. winged it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's a lot of vowels. So it's Paoloni. Paoloni. Yes. Awesome. I, I will do my best to, to remember that one. No um, worry. <laughs> so thank you very much. And for those of you who've joined in, this is Daniela. And I specifically reached out to... Her, I think you were probably the first person that I sent an email to regarding this event because I had heard about you and learned about you from Marissa Lawton. And when I was going through and building this thing and saying, I just want more people. I want more people to get it. Yeah. And she said, well, I know of someone. <laughs> and, and so when I started kind of looking you up and a little bit of Facebook, Google stalking, I'll admit it. Oh, that's um, fine. We all <laughs> yes, yes. I really started going, man, I used to live in California. Can I move back to California? Can we like work together? How can we do this? Um, so thank you for, for joining us. And those of you who haven't had a chance to read up on Daniela, I just wanted to give you a little bit of her background. I'm actually just going to read um, what she has sent me and what I've sent out to you guys she is an LMFT and a psychotherapist and consultant with a private practice in Westlake Village, California. Um, remind me, what part of California is that? So that's Southern California. That is just, uh, you know, not too far from Malibu. I feel, you know, everybody knows where that is. Um, so yeah, and I'm also licensed in Wyoming. So I do video telehealth specifically for those That's in Wyoming. right. I forgot about that. I've seen you in some of the groups talking about your work there and I, it, it, it threw me for a loop for a second. I was like, wait a second. I know. <laughs> They're not exactly near each other. So how does that work? <laughs> no. Um, but this is the benefit of, of telehealth these days, right? Absolutely. Um, Daniela is the founder of Westlake Village Counseling, specializes in chronic pain, illness, anxiety, trauma, and caregiver support, all the things that we need, I should speak for me, that I believe more of us need to know about. So I'm so grateful for you, um, especially since you are an esteemed public speaker and frequent guest speaker on podcasts, um, being quoted and published in a variety of different places, including The Mighty and Yahoo and Psych Central. I mean, that's just that's just pretty bomb. Um, and I really like that you incorporate specific approaches to get to those concrete tools, to get to actionable steps for the people that you're working with. Um, often when I'm talking with peers, there's a lot of vagueness and I get it. Most of the answers to a specific question in the world of mental health and healthcare in general is it depends. We need more information. But I really, I really appreciate that your therapy practice is working with those tools. Um, and right now, I think it's pretty cool that. Um, I know. You want to just grab and. I think that might be Mr. Ray's yeah. mic that's getting picked up. There we go. Thank you. Um, I think it's pretty cool that you're working on an online course called Moving Beyond Chronic Pain and Illness that's going to be released soon. And as soon as you told me about that, I was like, I want to know more. I'm ready to know more. <laughs> so let us know as soon as there's, you know, some teasers out there, send us those links, send us that information. Um, I'm I'm kind of chomping at the bit for it. That's for sure. Okay. Awesome. It's great to hear. So anything that I haven't already just discussed and mentioned about you, I'd, I'd love for you to just kind of introduce yourself a little bit more, how you started in the field um, in mental health and then transitioned into um, working with chronic pain and chronic illness. And that's no problem, um, Mr. Ray. There's this, this is the world we're in. <laughs> So where to begin? Okay, so um, 
Well, I went to grad school like, you know, like therapists do. Um, and I kind of got myself into grad school like many people did in 08 when we, when the economy tanked. And I was like, okay, let's, you know, I got laid off and, you know, I want to do something, have meaning and, you know, contribute in a meaningful way. And so there I found myself into this the program for uh, counseling psychology. And, um, but in the midst of all of that was when my chronic illness, it was before I went into grad school, my chronic illness and health symptoms were getting worse. I would say mm, two, three years prior to actual grad school. But I think the added stress of being in graduate school and navigating school, work, life, health, doctor appointments um, caused my health and pain to get worse. So it was a uh, real learning curve uh, for me to adapt and try and get through grad school as, as much as possible. Usually the track is a two year track when you're full time, but because it was so severe for me, I had to go to part time. So it took me an extra year, which isn't the end of the world, but it was um, a true test um, of a crossroads. I was like, okay, I'm either gonna make it, uh, a year, you know, after a year, I'm like, okay, I'm either gonna drop out because I don't know how I'm gonna do practicum, or um, I'm gonna push through and figure this out. And I did, I, I managed to figure it out. Um, so, but all the while in school, it, um, it just really drove it home to me. Like, this is, this is the niche, this is the population I really need to serve. And um, it really became so clear to me because part of graduate school, as, as clinicians, we all know, you go and you have to do your own personal therapy. And so I abided. I'm like, okay, no problem. I'll do that 20, 20 uh, hours of personal therapy. At the time, it was 20. I'm sure nowadays they require more. But I couldn't find a therapist who I felt was really getting what I was going through. Didn't, didn't have the lens of chronic pain and illness as um, a perspective. Um, I had one therapist whose sibling had fibromyalgia and I'm like, okay, well that's better than nothing. But I wasn't really getting, I didn't know what I wanted, but what I was getting wasn't what I was needing and it wasn't what I wanted. So it kind of was that point in time where it kind of directed me into how can I, how can I not do what these clinicians are doing? Um, I liked the CBT lens. That's what I was able to get out of those sessions, but that's essentially it. Um, and nothing more than that, which was really a, a letdown. So that really formed my path as to how to kind of go forward once I got licensed and, you know, in between. So that's a little bit about me. I think that you're talking about yourself and your story, but it resonates so much for me and for the other people that I have met and talked with um, as we wind and we work our way through this, this journey. It's, there's those pieces of saying there's a hole here, right? Whether it's early or you know, mid-career or late career, we, we begin to recognize that there's a hole and that when we really start paying attention, we can do something about it. And um, and I love that, that you are, and you're doing it in the way that you are. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's really fulfilling. It took a few years to kind of, you know, after you get licensed, I think you go through all of the trials and tribulations of getting your hours, marking those T's, dotting the I's, taking the exams. And then by the time I got licensed, I was so scared because I had done, I worked so hard. <laughs> I didn't want to, I didn't want to mess it up. So I think it took a few years for me to get more comfortable and go my way and feel, get into my own groove of, of, of my approaches and stuff. And, and I, I'm in that space now, but it took a little while. Oh, so. <laughs> you know, some of us are rebels early on. Some of us have to get our feet wet. That's okay. Um, I think some of my supervisors would have preferred preferred if I hadn't been a rebel as early on as I was. Um, so I, I'm really just ready to learn from you as much as I'm sure the people who have joined in are. So I'm going to just turn it over to you. Everybody who's here, um, just a reminder as Danielle's pulling up her um, screen share and all of that. Um, my name is Maggie Dickens. I'm a licensed professional counselor in Texas and I am passionate about helping people understand the intersection of chronic pain and substance use. And so Danielle is going to talk to us about the emotional aspects of pain. If at any time you have any questions, just put them in the chat, but we will um, have some space at the end to just talk things through. 
So one thing I'm just noticing, I'm trying to screen, do a screen share and I'm getting a pop-up. It says Zoom will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit. So I think I have to get out of the Zoom and then get back in in order to set up the screen share. Um, so the way that the recording is, is when I end the meeting, that's when it's going to share everything or that's when it records down. Because my options it. are to select later or quit now. So it's saying, I don't know. So I'm just, I just don't want to click the wrong thing here. Do I click later or quit now? I would do later because if you quit now, you're going to leave, I think. Okay, try later. Okay, now let's see if I can screen share. Yes, okay, now we're in business. Okay. Awesome. That made me nervous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, can you all see my screen? I can see it. Okay, cool. I'm going to minimize the little boxes yeah. on this screen here. Oh, hold on. Let me escape. There, move that out of the way. Okay. Now we go back. Perfect. And the chat says that we can see it as well. That's great. Okay. I don't see the chat, but I'll let you, Maggie, kind of uh, navigate that if there's something that shows up in there. Perfect. Um, okay, cool. All right. So, so glad you all joined me today. I know we have a lot going on in the world and I appreciate you taking the time to to sit in and listen and engage with me. Um, so my name is Daniela Pelloni. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed in California and Wyoming. And my specialty is chronic pain and illness. Um, I do a lot of speaking and consultation as well. So um, the specialties within my niche of chronic pain and illness are medical illness and trauma, caregiver support, pain management, Chronic illness-induced PTSD, and that is terminology and uh, that's coming into the, the forefront um, slowly but surely. Um, if you Google my name and chronic illness-induced PTSD, you'll find an article where me and other clinicians or doctors kind of are talking about that niche of a type of PTSD, which exists. And then health anxiety and depression. And aside from those things, I'm also just a regular person. I'm an animal lover. That's a picture of my cat, Nero. And I also enjoy the outdoors and go hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains um, when we're not in quarantine and when we're allowed to. Um, so there you go. Okay, so if we were to get into the typical definition of what chronic is defined as in the medical community, it means that it's lasting three months or longer. Um, and according to Treed um, in his publication, he, he says it is defined as pain lasting longer than three months after the resolution or in the absence of an injury. So that kind of gives you an idea of how it's defined. But the reality is, is having chronic pain is emotional. And so the information I'm going to share with you in this presentation is a combination of my own personal experiences with chronic pain and illness, which I have had for the past 12 years, and also uh, incorporates what I've learned in school, what I've learned in my clinical work, and from colleagues who also specialize in these fields, in these specialties, um, and they may or may not have chronic pain and illness. So it's really a combination of things. Um, this is like the tip of the iceberg, but I'm going to do my best to jam pack as much as I can in this, um, in this webinar or in this talk. So chronic pain, having it and embodying that is an emotional experience. And I also want to drive home the reality that it is also traumatic. It's a traumatic event. Everything is on a continuum. Everything's on a scale. So some people might have some low levels of chronic pain that are just a nuisance, while other people, it can be life altering. Um, and so it all just varies case by case, but oftentimes it shows up as a traumatic experience because the pain is ongoing and you literally cannot walk away from it. It's in your body. You can't just shut it off like a light switch and you can't trade in your body for a new one either. That's kind of a joke amongst the chronic illness community. Um, this body is kind of uh, breaking down on me. Can I get a new one, please? Um, and perhaps chronic pain uh, individuals would also have the same sentiment. So if you as a clinician do not have chronic pain or chronic illness, I just want you to ask yourself this. What would it be like for you if you lived day in and day out with persistent chronic
chronic and even debilitating pain. So I know we have some people um, listening in, um, taking notes, what have you. So if you wanna chime in and type in a response, you're more than welcome to, um, or not, that's okay. But just think about that. Like, what would it be like for you if that was your existence? If you embodied low, low levels that ebbed and flowed into higher levels of pain that just were following you all day, every day. The, um, the, the side effects of having chronic pain and the emotional effects are fatigue, poor sleep, irritability, hypervigilance, fearful of pain and having anticipatory fear. I know it's a little repetitive, but let's start with fatigue. If you're in chronic pain, that is literally physically and emotionally exhausting. So fatigue is going to exist. You're also probably gonna have a few nights, some nights or most nights where you're not getting good sleep because the chronic pain doesn't shut off at night when it's time to close your eyes and go to bed. That's not the way it works. It is intrusive and it shows up all hours, that's just the way it is. That is the reality of the picture. So you're not necessarily getting the best quality sleep. So it's leaving you tired and you're gonna be irritable. And who would be in a good mood if they have chronic pain going on in their lives day in and day out? That's just not realistic. And the hypervigilance is that fear, fear of pain. There can be, depending on the severity of pain that person is experiencing, there can be, um, almost an anticipatory fear, uh, a traumatic fear of the next pain flare up. How bad is that pain gonna be? Or fear, I know I can speak to this, fear of going and doing things like that require an entire day of being out and a long commute. And the fear and the anxiety that kind of comes with that of, oh, I don't know if I can sit in the car that long. Um, what if we get stuck in traffic? You know, all of these factors can really increase that anxiety and that fear um, because you feel like you are almost uh, at the at the whim of whatever your body is is going to present. You just kind of have to bear bear for the next flare up and and hope for the best. Chronic pain and emotional health effects. Um, continuing that, you know, how could chronic pain not have an effect on mental health and emotions? It's just not realistic. There is no way you can really separate those two things. And I've described it to people who don't have chronic pain or, or don't have chronic illness is it can feel like you are treading water because you are so fatigued. You are irritable at times or more times than maybe you'd like to admit if this, you know, if this describes you or your patient. Um, and you're just trying to get through the day. That is what the experience is like for them. Um, and if the pain is on the severe side or you're having those flare-ups and you're that chronic pain patient, you might be feeling like you are a bystander to life, a bystander to the world, not getting the opportunity to be an active participant because you're having to kind of bow out of commitments of social things because you don't have the energy or you just are, are tapped out energetically, or you're just not in the mood because you don't feel well. So this really leads into the concept of grief and loss. So imagine again, if you do or don't have chronic pain, or if you have a client in mind who does have chronic pain, just think about their experience, the loss of the life perhaps they once had. For, like for me, I didn't have, I was a quote unquote healthy person for the first 26 years of my life. And then things started to change. Um, life was good. My body was functioning and healthy and not hurting. And then that just kind of slowly was getting chipped away. So it can really bring up that feeling of the loss of life you once had, the loss of the social connections. Um, you know, your relationships will change. To, depending on the severity of, of what that experience is for you, if you have chronic pain or for that client. Um, being carefree is probably gonna be tailored back a bit. Um, I personally am not, I was not exactly the most spontaneous person before chronic pain entered my life, um, but I will say after chronic pain and illness kind of set in, being spontaneous and going to San Diego for the weekend is just not something I'm probably gonna do because I need a lot of planning preparing. I need all sorts of uh, 
you know, me or chronic pain people, they need their pillows and their medicine. And, you know, it's, it's a very, it can be very involved because there are all these things that need to be taken into consideration. And then there's the financial loss because medical expenses have increased more frequent doctor visits and procedures and, and tests and ongoing care needs. Loss of the healthier body you had, you used to have, loss of the connection from friends, family, coworkers. So this really um, highlights, you know, feeling misunderstood and is isolated. And with clients, I think the thing that's really important to drive home for them is how important it is that they are the experts of their own body. Um, it's really common for, for clients who have chronic pain and chronic illness to go to the doctor, to go to some mental health or medical health professional or specialist where they're being directed into doing A, B, C, D treatment plan of sorts. So there can be a bit of a power differential. Now, I'm not going to say that's always the case, but that can happen. And I think it happens more often than I would like in general. I'm being very general here. But um, I would say most of the clients I have who happen to have chronic pain and illness do have experiences where there's a bit of a power differential between them and whoever, whoever the provider is that's working with them. And that's why I think it's really important to drive home that they know their body best, better than I will ever know, because they embody what it is to live in, in their shoes with the sensations, the discomfort, the pain, and the associated experiences to their chronic pain that I will never fully understand. Yes, I have chronic pain. Yes, I have chronic illness, but my experiences are very unique to myself and their experiences are very unique to them. Um, they may not get that kind of um, message from the medical community. Um, and so that's why I think it's our work as clinicians to kind of go above and beyond to help them really get the message that their voice matters, their experiences matter, and they really are the experts of what's going on with them physically. Um, I can tell you my clients generally are really um, able to distinguish, you know, oh, I tried this thing and this was the after effect, or I noticed this symptom flare up. Like most of the time they can really pinpoint these things um, and that highlights they know themselves better than anyone ever could. But because this is an experience they, that those with chronic pain encounter and chronic illness encounter, um, there can be seeds planted of self-doubt, especially for patients who don't necessarily have a diagnosis. I have a few. They have, they've been given the diagnosis of fibromyalgia or irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I can say at least with IBS, that's one that um, is a diagnosis of exclusion. There's no actual test that says, oh yeah, you have IBS. It's just like, well, you have these symptoms. We don't really know what's wrong with you, so there you go. So, they, so patients might have a general diagnosis because the doctors maybe aren't sure what's going on, or they might actually have a definitive diagnosis that's explaining their chronic pain symptoms, um, or they might never reach an actual diagnosis. So that's another spectrum to take into consideration where how much that how much self-doubt they might have as the person with the chronic pain, like, oh, am I imagining this? Or am I making this more dramatic than it really is? Um, you know, that narrative can really happen. Um, and that happens, unfortunately, a lot. Um, friends mean their best, mean well. Family tries their best, they mean well. But there can often be a disconnect. And the, the receiving, the conversations between that person with chronic pain and what they're and what they're saying and hearing from their friends, family, or medical professionals could be not what they need to hear and instead make that person with the chronic pain just kind of shut down because it's just not what they're seeking. The, the emotional pain points when they're trying to express what's going on with them are, meet, are being met with, oh, have you tried this? Or, oh, well, I had an acute thing for three months, you know, like different kind of responses. And that just kind of puts that person with chronic pain in this place of shutting down. Like, okay, well, I guess I won't talk to that person anymore because this is kind of the, the direction the dialogue tends to go. And again, I will say that was the case for me too. 
Um, so it's just like, okay, I'm seeing this uncle, he's really nice and all, but he's kind of Mr. Fix-It and like, he just doesn't, he doesn't know how to help me and that's okay. He doesn't know how to hear me and listen to what my pain is. And that's all right. I'm just gonna give him the generic canned responsive, yeah, everything's good, I'm still working on things. Um, and there's that, you know? So it's just this experience that we need to kind of take into account as clinicians you know, they get to have an opportunity with us in the office or in the virtual space these days to be heard and listened to. And I think it very well might be the only place for a lot of them where they're actually getting uh, heard and listened to and validated with their, with their feelings about their pain. So it really is um, a buildup of past experiences. So we have to take into consideration the whole picture of, of these clients. You know, they don't just come into our offices all of a sudden with, you know, intense presenting concerns only because of chronic pain. The likelihood is there's other things that have accumulated over time that are challenging life events, past traumas, significant life altering events, or, or just anything in between that has left an impact. And so it's a combination of those experiences we need to take into account, um, including what happened in the past and what's going on presently with their medical health, with their uh, mental health, with their chronic pain, um, to really paint a clinical picture of their chronic pain experience to try and kind of gauge where that is. So what could be, you know, to expand on this topic of contributing factors, I kind of listed a few just a minute ago, but I'll reiterate, you know, there could be pre-existing psychological factors, ACEs, which are adverse childhood experiences, and then PTSD, medical trauma, complex trauma. I will say most of my clients have complex trauma. Most of them do. Now the complex trauma could be a combination of, um, of early childhood experiences, of abuse, assault, uh, you know, uh, the things that normally would show up on an ACEs um, assessment. Um, however, those traumas also uh, get compounded when medical trauma or chronic pain, traumatic related events kind of happen. So maybe that patient had um, to go to the emergency room because the pain was so severe um, and they had a bad experience. Um, or, or there was some kind of um, you know, negative side effect to a treatment they did to address their pain or you know, nerve ablations. I can't tell you how many patients I've, I, I've worked with who've had to have nerve ablations. I mean, that is extraordinarily painful from what I hear. So these experiences can really contribute to and, um, and intensify the, the chronic pain experience. And then we take into account lifestyle um, and also, where's their social support? Do they have people they can talk to or do they not? And, and also medical support. How good of a medical treatment team do they have? Are they all kind of talking to each other? Um, what's the level of communication between them and the patient? You know, where the patient's feeling heard and listened to and a part of the process? Um, and then as far as so socioeconomic factors, that's really something to pay attention to. Um, Poverty, um, financial worry, those are things that also layer into the chronic pain experience. And the, the poverty uh, component really actually has been researched where there's been independent like groups studied in a research study. Um, out of the three, one of the groups, um, they're all uh, you know, experiencing you know, low income, poverty, and all groups were treated um, based on their medical conditions the same way. However, out of those three groups, the group with the, the low uh, financial income level experiencing poverty continue to experience uh, significant chronic pain after quote unquote treatment was completed and after the study. So there are things we really need to take into account that are outside factors that shouldn't be outside factors just to kind of be more, more well-rounded in how we conceptualize each, each case that we work with. Um, and in light of recent events, uh-huh, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, so yesterday, Leslie Downing was talking about maximizing the biopsychosocial assessment. And what I'm hearing you say is we really can't just take for granted a traditional checkbox when we're getting to know people. We have to really keep in mind what is going on beyond the room, beyond the therapy room, 
and say, okay, you, you tell me that you have social support. What does that look like? You may have a spouse, but are you able to talk with them? That's different than having full social support if you're, you know, you just happen to, to be married, but they don't mm -hmm. get it. They don't listen and they don't um, kind of connect with you. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's the, um, you know, yeah, again, like painting the picture. Okay, you have support with your friends. You know, maybe someone will say, yeah, I get support with my friends. They're really supportive. They get it. But my family, they're just a bunch of jerks. Like they just kind of roll their eyes at me thinking I'm being dramatic and I just am seeking attention and pity or something, you know. So it's like, where are those pockets of support? You know, just because you're married, like you say, yeah, I, I can't. I also um, oversee as an admin, a chronic illness group. And um, I can't tell you how many spouses join on behalf of their spouse or partner or, or the person with the chronic pain is in the group because they just aren't getting support anywhere else, not from their spouse, not from their partner. Um, and so, yeah, really looking at the, um, the profile of where, where those supports exist and, and, if, and where there are gaps and where there are gaps is where we can help direct them to that. Like essentially as a case manager would of, okay, well, let's explore like what online support groups are available or you have fibromyalgia. Well, there's a bunch of, you know, support groups in person, but I know they host some that are virtual. So you could be their peer, maybe there are peer led groups, you know, different ways to kind of be more um, flexible in trying to tailor the su support options for them based on kind of how they're coming into you when you see them. So, so yeah, and I think, you know, especially with what's going on in the world right now, um, really taking to, in, into account race, income disparities, disparities in healthcare, not everybody has healthcare, and just because you have healthcare doesn't mean it's great. Um, you know, and the other thing too, to keep in mind as a clinician, and by all means, I encourage you all to research this, is, you know, look at the disparity in quality of care uh, in the healthcare field. Um, there are disparities, you know, between men and women. Men typically are, are given better quality of care. Um, their presenting concerns are typically attended to in a quicker span of time versus female patients. Um, and then if we look at the female population, there's disparity among Caucasian women going into medical care treatment versus women of color. So again, these are factors we need to take into consideration. Again, feel free to research this. But I think these are all things we need to take into account as far as what are the uh, what is the environment and what are the obstacles these these patients are are encountering um, outside of traditional um, you know mental health and treatment are all these socioeconomic and healthcare factors. So okay, so. Um, so I've definitely at this point kind of linked how emotions and chronic pain interconnect. And the part that I wanna emphasize here is how our mood really does influence our perception of pain. So there's plenty of research and I'll kind of get into that in the next few slides, but if someone is experiencing depression and anxiety, they are more likely to then um, report if they were to self rate their pain, they're more likely to self-rate that pain as being more intense. Alternatively, if someone's in a good mood or in an emotionally neutral mood, they are going to likely report that pain as being less intense. And this also has been researched, um, so I'll get into that. But this, um, these findings come from a doctor who's an assistant professor of medicine at Virginia Commonwealth, and he's also a psychiatrist. So the role of emotional health and chronic pain. So if we were to get more specific, uh, Stanford University did a study on neck pain and they evaluated both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients who had abnormal MRI findings. So that's an MRI is, you know, a scan. And they concluded that the severity of the MRI lesions did not predict the presence of pain but actually it was the pain severity was correlated with whether patients had underlying psychological issues. So I think that's really an important thing to, to think about. 
And pain is more likely to become chronic in people who tend to catastrophize or somaticize or feel a lack of control in decision making. So that's why if I were to reference back to what I said earlier, there can often be a, a power differential between the patient and the clinician, not necessarily the therapist, but the, the medical doctor, the specialist. And so that can leave them feeling powerless and, oh, well, he's saying I have to take this medicine or she's saying I need to do this test and all of these things. There can be a bit of a power differential or literally just feeling powerless as, you know, in their own experience with chronic pain because they don't have the answers and they're so desperate for some relief and they're feeling just a lack of control over their circumstances. So the emotional part, you know, overlaps into all of this too. So really taking into account their, their thought patterns is an important thing. There's another study, quite a large study, um, and they concluded that the association between perceived neck pain and mental stress was much stronger than the association between neck pain and repetitive occupational activities. So, you know, I think we all can understand what that means, but I'll give myself as an example. You know, um, I have neck and shoulder, I have a neck injury and it affects my neck and shoulder, my right shoulder. So if I'm doing repetitive movement of writing or typing or raising my right arm over my shoulder and above my head, I am asking for trouble. I know that that repetitive type of movement is going to cause significant flare ups for me. So that's what they mean when repetitive occupational activities is at play. So people maybe who have desk jobs. So even, even with repetitive movement, they're saying with their study, that doesn't compare to the intensity of pain when there's mental stress involved. That, that over, um, overcomes, that is more significant as a pain uh, predictor than actual physical repetitive movement. So we all have heard of the mind-body connection. That is nothing new. Um, but John Sarno was one of the doctors back in 1998 and in the 90s who really got the concept forward. He moved the needle forward. Um, and in his findings, in his practice, he was known as the doctor who really, um, you know, revolutionized how low back, chronic low back pain could be addressed. And his unconventional methods proved successful for most of his patients. And he published books and people read the books and they found relief. So he's, he was kind of a pioneer in his, in his approach. And he found that unexpressed emotions are responsible for neck, back, and limb pain in most patients. And that unexpressed anger accumulated as a result of internal and external pressures. So again, you want to take notice of their thought patterns. Certain patients with chronic pain are prone to maladaptive beliefs about their condition that may not be compatible with the physical nature of their pain. So again, that biopsychosocial evaluation is important, but also getting the picture of where, you know, the level of support they have, the stressors going on in their life. We all have stressors going on in our lives between the pandemic, the protesting, you know, you name it, all of these factors are, have added uh, a lot of stress to everyone across the board. Um, and so just taking into consideration all of these beliefs, um, how, much, how much of that is playing into it? And could that be exacerbating their perception of their pain? Yes, that is very possible. So that, that can happen where the severity of pain symptoms being expressed by the patient just don't line up medically, perhaps, with what their actual diagno diagnosed chronic pain condition is. Like, you know, maybe they have a bulging disc or something. I mean, I don't know. You can just, you're just like, this sounds like it's, it sounds like there's more. There sounds, sounds like there's more pain, emotional pain, unresolved trauma, unresolved emotional distress that's coming up or being re, re, uh, in, reinitiated perhaps with someone, you know, again, in light of current events that have just kind of brought to the surface old wounds and new injuries to, to past emotional hurts. That's really contributing to their intensity of pain that they're feeling. 
Daniela, I think those of us who get referrals from physicians find exactly what you are explaining is the reason for the referral. A lot of physicians will sometimes nicely, sometimes not so nicely explain, hey, you're describing something that doesn't match up to the image. The image that I see, the MRI or whatever image that they're looking at, doesn't match the words that the patient is using. And so they will refer to a therapist and not always um, in a way where the, the client feels supported. And I think that takes us back to, to what you were talking about earlier, where we are the people that get to listen, to get to sit with them and finally hear versus interrupting and saying, well, here's what you should be feeling. Here's what, where you should be at three months out. Um, and, and so I, I think we, at least for me, I get a lot of referrals from that experience that you just described. Yep. That's, yeah, that's exactly it. So if we were to think about and continue this conversation about thoughts and pain perception, um, the, the important thing here is that unrealistic or negative thoughts about an ongoing pain problem may contribute to increased pain and emotional distress, decreased functioning and greater resilient, oh, I'm sorry, greater reliance on medication. So that's where, you know, that, that pattern can emerge and oftentimes does where someone is just seeking out the medication because it's maybe a possible quick fix for them. They're hoping that it is. So I would say a key takeaway here is the more uh, we can convey to patients, the, the more they're able to acknowledge and process their feelings, the more they're able to release and reduce the physical and emotional pain and trauma. So really, when you are working with someone with chronic pain, I want you as a clinician to make sure you feel like you have training, expertise um, in working with those with complex trauma and also have expertise and training in how to support those going through grief and loss. Those are crucial, I would say. So really what you want to do is meet the client's emotional needs as best you can. Like I said earlier, painting that picture, ask that client, you know, I find this to be the most, one of the most effective ways. Once you have rapport and they feel comfortable talking to you, you know, what does a good day look like for you? Uh, what does a bad day look like for you? Just so you literally get a picture in your mind of their level of functioning. Um, are, are they really struggling to get out of bed or do they barely have enough energy to, you know, make breakfast and then they're ready for another nap? Like they're just so exhausted. Like where are they at? Um, but I also think that's important because they're probably not getting asked that question by anyone else who's trying to connect with them and get, get that kind of understanding of where they are at emotionally and physically with their pain. Um, and, and I think for clinicians, this is important for us to really build up our understanding, our conceptualization of where things are at for them, but also to really enhance the empathy um, we can tap into. Uh, I, I know one thing that helps me is I tap into times earlier in my journey with chronic pain and illness when my level of functioning was pretty bad. I, I was going through treatments and I didn't have a lot of energy or stamina. I was losing weight because I wasn't hungry, because I was nauseous, because of the medication. I mean, it was the whole thing. And um, thinking back to that time, how it was so difficult just to get out of bed and have energy to do much of anything. So for me to be able to connect with clients, I kind of think back to those times and whether or not you have had or do have you know health issues or chronic pain just thinking back to a time when you were feeling really down or had some kind of a medical or, or physical ailment or something and just think about that and think about gosh i remember that time let me try and tap into that time in my life in the past and now let me imagine that going on for years you know so, so that you can try to meet them at that emotional pain point and I think all of these efforts are really helpful for them because you get to model and create corrective experiences of, hey, you know, 
this, this is what a supportive and caring interaction looks like. And I want you to know this exists. It's not just exclusive to you and I in the therapy space. Like you can have this. You can find those core people who have chronic pain or illness or both in an online community, in, a, in, a, in an app or you know, in person, in support groups or, or friends that you know or family members, it, it can happen. It does exist. And again, it's really important for them to really understand that it is okay to have feelings and it is natural to experience emotional ups and downs when living with chronic pain. For those of us who have chronic pain and illness, um, I like to reference the saying, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon because there is no quick fix or finish line that's going to happen, you know, at the, you know, quickly. It's just not feasible. So really allowing them to know there's going to be ups and downs. You're allowed to have feelings and emotions about this. And you are going to have moments of sadness, grief, guilt, and all of the others, including anger, because you're human. And these are real life human experiences that you're having to navigate. And that's normal and natural and okay. And on the flip side, you know, not expressing your feelings in places where you feel comfortable and safe, you know, that's going to come at a cost and that will likely continue the cycle of pain and prolong the, the discomfort that you're feeling. And that's probably not what you want to happen. Whenever I say something like that, they're like, no, I don't want it to continue. I said, okay, so let's create new pathways, new thoughts, new behaviors where you are expressing your feelings in different ways. So you're not holding on to all of that because the longer you hold on to all of that, the, the more you're physically gonna experience that pain and the longer it's gonna take to, to, get, to get to where you want it to be. So be patient with the process. Healing is not linear. This is an image I got from Instagram, I think. And um, I just, I thought it was ap appropriate. Um, Healing, everyone's like, oh, you know, it's a quick fix. You go from A, B, and you get to C. But no, that's not the case with chronic pain. That's not the case with chronic illness. It is a winding path. And I think a really amazing uh, concept that was created by Christine, and I'm going to say her name wrong, Miss Serendino, um, is Spoon Theory, and uh, she created Spoon Theory uh, up there as her website, but you don't look sick.com. It was originally something she created as someone who has lupus, um, and that obviously includes, um, you know, joint muscle pain, fatigue, and that's a lifelong condition when you have uh, lupus. So she wanted to convey to her best friend what it was like for, for her to go through living life uh, with chronic illness and chronic pain. And so she grabbed a bunch of spoons at a restaurant they were eating at, at a desperation, trying to get the point across to her friend. And she said, listen, here's seven spoons. You get seven spoons. And the friend's like, okay, I'll play this game. And, um, and each spoon represents a unit of energy of being thoughtful and attentive to where you're going to invest that spoon in the day. So she gave her friend seven spoons and then played out her day in the life of what she has to do. And then by three o'clock in the afternoon, maybe she only has two spoons left because taking a shower took a spoon, creating, uh, making her breakfast demanded another spoon. Then it took her two hours to get ready for work. Um, and she tried not to beat herself up about it. And that took two spoons. So there's four spoons and she hasn't even left the house yet to go to work. So this concept I think is incredibly uh, relatable and empowering and helpful to those with chronic pain because they can relate to this. And if you go to her website, there is a PDF download that you can, uh, you can print out, you can save, you can send it to your clients. And it, it, it's the story of this scene that I'm painting for you um, of how she explains this theory. And what's great about Spoon Theory is it really took off. And people who are part of this community call themselves Spoonies. So I created this um, image years ago for Instagram, and I'm, I call myself a Spoonie. Uh, my friends are Spoonies who are in the chronic illness, chronic pain community, and it's a really nice community to be a part of because there is that sense of, of connection, of understanding. We may not have each other's exact um, pain profile, medical conditions, chronic pain conditions, but we have, we can relate to the pain points. There is that connecting thread of 
of experiences of, oh, you had an, you had an experience with your doctor today. Oh yeah, I've been there. Like, you know, we're, or, or, oh, you had that uncomfortable conversation with that, you know, family member who's like, oh, you're still sick or, oh, you're still hurting kind of a commentary. There is this understanding within the community. And so this also, I think, extends to those with chronic pain. And I've used it with individuals with chronic pain. And it's, it's been a very helpful model, Spoon Theory, to help them feel a sense of belonging and being understood. And I talked about grief briefly. And I think this, um, this is a really good uh, model to reference as well. Um, because it expands on the five stages of grief with the seven stages, which include loss of self and confusion, and then reevaluation of life roles and goals. And so those two steps are really things that those with chronic pain can identify with. You lived life a certain way, were healthy, and now some of that or a lot of that maybe has been changed dramatically. Who am I? I don't recognize myself. You know, I used to be this fun loving, energetic person, and now I'm, you know, navigating just barely managing getting to work and taking care of my medical appointments and all of this, and, and it's exhausting. There's that sense of loss of self and that confusion of, you know, what's ahead of me? You know, this is, this is confusing. And then that reevaluation okay, this is now what my life looks like. What am I going to do with this? How am I going to make meaning out of this life? How will I? be effective and helpful? What are my goals? How do I see myself in this world, in this body that, that has evolved? And for time's sake, because I think we're kind of running out of time, um, I'm going to speed up a little bit, but I've talked about all of these things. Give them tools to make them feel empowered with education, um, validating their feelings, doing the typical rapport building. Takeaway messages, it's okay to feel your feelings and it's okay to feel your pain. A lot of people wanna shut off their mind from their body and not access the pain because it's so distressing for them. So that's something to really be mindful of. Um, and all feelings are welcome. Holding onto the emotional and physical pain will keep you stuck in that chronic pain cycle. And leaning into that part of the stages of grief of acceptance, I frame it as acknowledgement. Acknowledge your body for where it is in this moment in time. Uh, meet your body where it's at. Uh, instead of resisting and trying to continue living life the way you did before the pain, just, just be attentive to the cues your body is telling you. So if your body had a voice, if your pain or discomfort had a voice, what would it be saying to you? And really listen to that. And that's, it's trying to communicate, you know, framing it in that way. This pain is showing up for a reason. What is it trying to tell me? Maybe it's telling me to like slow down, you know, stop rushing. Maybe it's telling me to take a breath. And the more they do that, the more they're building that new relationship with themselves and the more they're building on the muscle of self-compassion and being curious about these cues that are showing up in their body. And that's really key uh, for helping them to acknowledge, honor, and listen to all the parts of them that are showing up in different ways to get their attention. Pain is showing up for a reason. It's trying to communicate. What is it the message is trying to, sh to show you or tell you? And that kindness and compassion is critical. Um, exercising that practice for that chronic pain patient, they need to implement that. And that might take time. And that typically is a hard, can be a hard transition to make, but it's, it is necessary to, to kind of expand on that. These are two books I really recommend. Um, I typically recommend Self-Compassion to most of my clients to read that book. Um, and depending on, you know, some clients, I, I will reference and recommend they read Freedom from Pain. Um, I think both of these are really good reads. And so really when we come to a place of recognizing where our body is in the moment, that really helps us bring about greater calm, healing, and support for the mind and body. And as Maggie referenced earlier, um, I've done interviews, I have articles on my website, and I do have a sign-up link if you guys want to get on the interest list for the online course for Moving Beyond Chronic Pain and Illness. And that is it for me. I will stop my share. Oh my goodness, I was just writing down. <laughs> Don't forget to go back to the interest link. I, um, I'm looking forward to that. I... 
I think I took, I mean, I took notes <laughs> um, on, on what you were talking about. Thank you so much. So before I just kind of get even more just in my own world, if anybody wants to, you know, unmute yourself or, you know, show your video and ask Danielle any questions or even have any feedback, um, I know that we were having a pretty good conversation in the chat about the experience of being a clinician with chronic pain and chronic illness um, and relating to, to you, Daniela, and, and so that was one that was really interesting. So if anybody has any questions, um, just... Looks like I've got a hand. Go ahead. Hey, this is Dane. Um, my question is um, around around making the determination if the pain is as a result of, uh, let's say, somatic symptoms and, and maybe trauma that they're carrying in their body or an actual, um, as you noted earlier, medical condition. Um, and, and the anxiety comes from that, and the pain comes from that. Have you been? Have you found a really good benchmark to be able to easily make that assessment or determination? So I come into that. Um, I don't. I don't feel comfortable making a determination because I think in most cases it's a combination of the two. I don't think you can separate chronic pain, whether it's medical in origin or not where there can be a, a connection supporting that. I think, I think for me, I, I view it from the lens of internal family systems and parts work. There are parts of us that have emotional wounds, early childhood experiences, adverse, you know, traumas, past traumas. Um, and, and that is something that has been layered and has maybe had a snowball effect to where that patient is at present. And maybe that patient does have an injury to their spine or they are recovering from surgery or maybe not. But I think the best way I can support them is to take into consideration all of those things and not go in my mind, oh, it's 100% this or oh, it's 100% that. Because I think that is where we will have missteps. Um, I, I, think, I think there's always some element of emotional pain that hasn't been processed and has continued to reside physically in the body. Um, and and it's, it's up to us to kind of help them to process that. And I think mind body somatic work is, a, is one way to do that. And I, I lean into that modality quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I, I see how your uh, your earlier graduate work has really informed your systems, your systems in the body and pain. <laughs> um, but no, that's very insightful. Um, I think it really is good to take the the bird's eye view, the larger look, the whole landscape, and all the moving pieces. Thank you. You're welcome, Candice. It looks like you have a question. Hi. Yes, um, I'm a newly licensed MFT, and I'm also diagnosed with lupus for the past 15 years, and I'm wanting to work with clients with chronic illness. Do you guys have any recommendations on resources or seminars that I can dive into to really just help me educate myself? I don't really have one offhand. That's, that's something I think is, is missing, to be honest. Um, in our field, I don't think we have really actual quote unquote trainings that you can get CEUs for, at least not yet. Um, I think, however, um, actually UCLA, I think they have a training, UCLA for chronic pain. Um, not sure if it's free or paid and I don't know if you get CEUs, but I believe they have some kind of program, chronic pain program. So that might be something to explore. I think reading material, um, I think those two books would be, would be good, but also The Body Keeps the Score. It's not specific to chronic pain, but it really talks about the layers of trauma and how they can show up. And um, EMDR is referenced, um, emotional freedom technique is referenced. That's what I happen to use um, as somatic ways to help uh, patients kind of unpack the trauma in a way that's not going to dysregulate them. Um, so I, I think doing trauma training will really be a good support, uh, 
to help you feel more informed and also just getting involved in the chronic illness communities such as the mighty website um you know so many chronic pain uh survivors write their own experiences there's so many there's a lot of articles and and personal takes and i think that would help inform you and see kind of the different lens and also i know for me i am i am involved in a lot of uh, Facebook groups that are health oriented, just as just as a as a person, not as a therapist, um, to to be helpful and to seek support myself. And I think getting involved in some kind of community like that would be helpful, just to hear hear the narratives of the different people in that group, what they're kind of dealing with, would be would be good. Awesome! Thank you so much. You're welcome. One of the things, Candace, that I have found, um, because I'm a clinician who specializes in this population and I don't have a chronic illness and I don't have chronic pain. And so I've had to do a lot of what Daniela has said, which is just researching and listening. And what I ended up doing was a lot of just reading, even just reading research. So what are, what are, what's the medical community saying about chronic pain management? And what I ended up finding myself doing is asking more questions and saying, well, well, why did this happen? And why did this happen? And a lot of that comes down to that cycle that Daniela talked about earlier of paying attention to the supports and the disparities in healthcare and those pieces that it just led through this web that um, I just kind of pieced it together um, because like, like Daniela mentioned, there isn't anything formal. My, my background started in rehabilitation counseling. And so I think that's the closest that we get. So I have a master's in rehabilitation counseling as well as one in clinical counseling. And that's where I bridged it, but I would never recommend someone to just go pick up a master's for the heck of it. Um, <laughs> it's a lot more work than that. Um, but even just looking at the research in the rehab world um, is really help was really helpful for me. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. Yeah, the looking at the research I think is great. Also, um, you know, feel free to take a look at my website. I've written pr probably at least 20 articles all on chronic pain and illness from different lenses. Um, podcast interviews, if you go to the media, media tab, there's maybe seven interviews. Some of them are an hour long, some are half an hour. Um, that probably will give you more, more input too. And then there's a podcast that my colleague in San Francisco has, and it's called this is not what I ordered. Her name is Lauren Selfridge. Um, and so she interviews uh, individuals with a variety of chronic pain and or illness conditions. Um, some are advocates, um, you know, or partners to someone with a, with a pain or illness condition. So that would also be a great resource too, just to kind of hear, the, hear their stories. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I want to just be mindful of time. If you have any other questions, I'm, I'm kind of volunteering everyone who is chatting with me every night to, um, I'm calling it voluntolding them. If you have any other questions, I know Daniela's in the Facebook group, pop on um, and, and ask those questions. And I, I have a feeling for those of you that will continue each, you know, kind of along this journey, you'll be able to expand your own understanding and how to connect what Daniela was talking about and putting it into your practice. Things like re, you know, rewiring the brain and talking about it from that CBT perspective. Uh, Dr. Michael Claybor is talking about that tomorrow night. Um, and so how to do that. So we're going to really expand on that. I'm going to do a, a small plug because I wrote down about four things that you said, Daniela, that plays into what I do, which is I utilize clinical hypnosis a lot. And things like parts work and getting a picture and using imagination and enhancing their curiosity, these are all pillars of clinical hypnosis. So if you're wanting to, to expand more on, on what Daniela was talking about, I'm um, I'm always down to talk about hypnosis, but I'll be talking about it more on the 12th. So thank you guys so, so much. Thank you, Daniela, for that very clear and thorough um, 
presentation. You, there's a lot of accolades happening in the chat right now. Um, it was very well received. I, like I said, I've got tons of notes here. Awesome. <laughs> um, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, I had some difficulty with the tech for last night, hoping I'll be able to get um, this replay uploaded um, for you and you'll hear from me soon. Everybody have a great night. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye, guys.